All right, Mark chapter 9. You have a multitude that are gathered together. I want to read about verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have a I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Now, I'm, we're going to read the rest of the story, but let's focus on one thing here first. If he brought him, he has faith. You know, I hear these these healing things and stories here in this modern day age, whatever you call it. And they bring and they can't get them healed. And they say, well, you don't have enough faith. Well, they got them there. Uh, they must believe. And what I'm going to talk to you about is believing, but being helped with your belief. And uh, hopefully I'll get it over. I don't, it's my fault. But all right, he says, uh, verse 12, uh, 18. And whensoever he taketh him, he teareth him. This is that dumb spirit. And foameth and gnashes with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Now, before I read on, turn to Matthew 10. All right, Matthew 10. Hold on to Mark 9. This is about the 12 apostles, which are 12 disciples, and he names them. So just to um, save time, verse 6, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely you give. He gave them that power. But here's one that they can't do. Okay. Now I don't I don't want you to I want you to understand there's something here involved. Um if disciples, the apostles, do all the things in Matthew 10 they're given the commission to, it was for signs and wonders in Israel to the uh, in Israel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now those terminologies mean something. In Israel were people that would believe. Just like in America, there are people that are going to believe. We don't know who they are. The apostles didn't know who they were. But they're recognized as the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay? So you make the house of Israel as a whole. They're going in Israel. And the lost sheep of that house of Israel would be saved. They would believe. Okay, so go back to Mark 9. So do they have the power to cast out devils? And this dumb spirit is a, is a devil, obviously. Uh, um, demons is not used here in the Bible. It's devils or spirits or evil spirits, things like that. Now, verse 19, he answered and said. Now, the, the back to verse 18. <clears throat> and... I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, him being the spirit, and they could not. Well, what's wrong here? There's something going on here. They have that power, okay? 19, he answered and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit carried him and fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him, unto him? And he said, of a child. Okay. Oftentimes it cast him into the fire. I mean, this is a vicious devil. This is a vicious spirit. Uh, not only does it, is it dumb, like they said, but this child, this individual, however old he is, he's been tormented by this thing, all right? And I, I thought about modern-day doctoring. What would they do with this individual? Well, most likely they'd put him in a psycho ward and get him all kinds of drugs. Well, how's that going to affect the spirit? There's a lot of things that people think is a sickness when it isn't a sickness, 
it's an evil spirit. Say, well, they don't exist. Of course they exist. They're, they'll exist till the end when God gets rid of all of it. Um, there are people that are probably in uh, nut houses and everything else that have evil spirits. And there is no medical cure for that. And that's when they say, though, well, we don't know how to cure him. We can't cure him. That's right. You can't with medical. You can't cure him with pharma. Uh, it takes the, the word of God. It takes the, the spirit of the Lord. It, ta it takes something to do this. And we don't have the power today as preachers to lay hands on the sick and do the things. That was the apostles. And that was for signs and wonders in Israel. But there is prayer. And prayer availeth much. And people don't realize that. If you believe and pray. But if you pray in doubt, I mean, uh, why do you expect God to do it? Now, don't get me wrong. God can heal any living soul on this earth if he wants to. And it won't be by my laying on hands. It will be by God's will. But what he would like is the reaction of the believers in the prayer, the, the effectual prayer of the righteous availeth much, praying to people, uh, to the Lord about people is not a wasted time, okay? Even though we don't necessarily see it, it's not wasted. And I, I think about Ananias in Acts 10, he uh, gave much alms and, and uh, helped the people of Israel and prayed to God, but he had no idea whether God was hearing him or anything was availing anything until later on when in Acts 10, the, the angel of the Lord or the individual told him, thy prayers and alms have come up for a memorial. So it was not a uh, wasted time. Your prayers are not a wasted time. There's some people that have more dedication to prayer than others. I, my wife is one of them. My wife is a dedicated prayer individual that prays all the time for people. And it, it has uh, effect, no doubt, whether we see it or not. And I believe that. Uh, I believe we all should pray without ceasing. Prayer is a relationship that helps us. And you understand when Jesus asked this man how long, he knew. He knew. He asked him to uh, how to get this over to you. Sometimes the Lord asks things of us so that it is a to us to see that he knows. Um, it is like he would ask us a question scripturally. He knows the answer. He knows what's going to happen. But it's for us to see that he knows. In other words, it's like a, a confirmation. But now look at verse 23. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe. Let's go back to verse uh, where we're reading. Uh, into the fire, into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now there is the statement, the but. But. A lot of people use yeah, but. Consider this. Do you pray and have doubts about God doing it? I'm just asking you. Uh, you don't have to get on an answer. Do you think God things in, in the prayer and think about things and, and you say it and you say it because you want God to think you're a good person by praying to him, but you don't think it'll work. <clears throat> I've heard people say well, we can try it, but I don't think it'll work. Now, you put doubt on something immediately when you say that in the first place. We can try it, but I don't think it'll work. But then if it does, you go, I knew it worked. Well, that's human. That's humans. That's actually what it is. Uh, so he says, if, but if thou canst do anything, he's questioning the Lord. If thou can do us anything, think of the things that the Lord's already done. Think of all the things the Lord's done in your life already. Think of how the Lord has made all things work together for good for you. And instead of praying, if you if can. Now, my prayer is always, if thy will, if it's thy will. It's not whether you can do it or not. God can do anything. 
He's God. He owns the world and all that's therein. He needs no houses. He needs nothing. He owns it all. He can do it all. It's, Lord, if you're willing, not if you can. God can. Okay? So, he believes in Jesus. Let's read on. Jesus said, and thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway, the father of the child cried out and said with, with tears, Lord, I believe, help thy, thou mine unbelief. Hmm. All around you are people that believe there is a God. Now, you have religions that make their gods into idols. But there are people around you that believe there are God. There is a God. They, they, they don't believe in the bang theory, yet they're not sure how they would deny it. Let's say it that way. But they believe in God. Okay? They believe in Jesus as the Son of God. They believe he was, he was born. They believe in the virgin birth because that's all they've heard. They believe that Christmas is the birth of Christ. They don't know any better. They believe that Easter is the resurrection of Christ. They believe there was a day when he died on a cross. So they believe in the cross. They believe in Jesus' resurrection. <clears throat> they believe he's the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. They don't know what that terminology really means, but they believe that. And they believe that he died for their sins. But what they don't believe is that they could be totally forgiven a new creature holy and without blame before him in love by simply believing something that is specific in the Bible. Okay, so I, I want you to understand it. Now let's read on to 25. When Jesus saw the people, that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter in no more unto into him. Now that's that's incredible. That that to me, no more can this spirit bother this child. Why? Because God said he could. No more. No more. Look at it in Paul's writing. In Romans 8, 31 to 39, and see that nothing can bother you once the spirit of the world is not in your conscience, but the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ is, by trusting the gospel of Christ. That, you got to think about that for a minute. Really meditate on that. He said to the dumb, foul spirit, Come not in the child again. Okay. The Lord Jesus Christ said that neither death nor life, who shall it be able to separate? There is nothing that can come in you and ever separate you from God again. That's incredible. Considering the world I live in is evil, the body I have is vile. The thoughts I have, the things I have, the things I've done, the desires and all that. And nothing changes that I'm holding without blame before him in love. I'm in him. And who is him? I'm in Christ Jesus who's seated at the right hand of the Father, guaranteeing me life eternal. That's wonderful. That's incredible. Let's go on. He said, <clears throat> verse 26, and the spirit cried and rent him and sore and came out of him. He didn't come out easy. He didn't just, oh, I got to go. I mean, he made a mess of it. He tried his best to hurt that child, do everything he could before he come out. Well, I think about that in terminologies of the godless world will try every possible way to corrupt your mind from the simplicity in Christ. He'll do it with his devices. He has many devices. His devices are evil. His devices are horrible. You might say some of the things he uses in the world. And the, some of the things that he uses are not ugly. He uses pretty things 
to corrupt you. I was telling uh, Danette about my grandson yesterday. I took my grandson, uh, Kathy and I had to go do something. So I took my grandson by Mary's work and left him there for just a few minutes. He wanted to see his mom and we had to go do something with uh, Susie and Kaylee and, and Craig. And we landed up eating with them. So I went back, I got, went back and picked up my grandson while they were doing something and got him a burger uh, from McDonald's. And when we came back, he said, Papa, and he looked at me dead serious. He said, can I go, would it be all right if I go to church tomorrow with this man uh, who's there, his, his name is Paul. And I thought he was talking about a, a schoolmate. Well, come to find out this guy staying in the motel where Mary works is one of those speaker motivators and he's doing it for the house of prayer. And he's trying to work and get kids in there, see so cradle roll them. And he, Miles was in there and he was talking to Miles and he tells him, he, you know, you'd be nice if you came and, and with the other kids and listen to whatever. And I looked at him and said, Miles, <clears throat> my, my girls never went to church in their life. I wouldn't let them. Oh, sounds, that sounds cruel. No, I wouldn't let them because I didn't want them to face religion and be tempted of that religion, which is very subtle and very, very beautiful. And his words that came out of his mouth is, he's really a nice guy. Well, that means that I'm not because I teach him. He comes to class, I teach him. I said, Miles, they will probably not give you the gospel. And I sit there and I gave him the gospel. I explained the gospel to him right then. I said, do you know the gospel of your salvation? Well, he said there, he's eight years old, he died. And I said, the gospel of your salvation is Christ died for our sins according to scripture. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to scripture. And he looked at me and remember, children absorb everything. And so he said, well, my mom, I said, who told you you could go to church? Well, my mama told me she, and she'd take me. I said, your mama has to work tomorrow. Well, she's going to take me. Well, I knew there was a fib in all this, you know, let's just say a lie. And I was a little upset because I don't want my grandson going to church. And I'm just point blank. I don't want him to go where they start filling his head with them smooth talk, smooth words, those words that Timothy talks about and fill him up with all kinds of wrong things that I'll have to deal with with him and might not ever be able to get him to see the truth. Yes, I believe in staying away from church. And if people don't like it, that's just tough. That's the way it is. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteous with unrighteous? What communion has light with darkness? What, uh, 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 I mean, it just goes on. Second Corinthians 6, 14 through the end of the chapter. And so I had to get out of the car and Kathy was over somewhere and I come and got her. I said, this is what's been going on. So she went and questioned me by herself and kind of find out that Mary had never said she would take him. She never said anything about it. It's a lie. And I knew it was because Mary don't go to church either. She ain't going to church except Bible studies. And I thought these smooth talking guys cradle roll these kids. And once they get cradle roll in there and they live in it long enough, you can't hardly get them out. And that's the subtle way not only did Satan go to Eve, he'll go to your children because they are very gullible. They'll listen, but they like pretty things. They like gymnasiums. They like all kinds of games. They like all kinds of music. They like all this stuff. And I have no idea what they're doing in these modern day churches. They may even have uh, electronics for them to use in the, in the classrooms or so forth. So they use the pretty things. They don't use the preaching, which that's what it pleased God by the foolishness of. But one last thing, Kathy, when she was talking to him, she asked him what the gospel, and he told her because he remembered what Papa said. Now, you don't tell me they don't remember. They remember. 
And he flat told her, he said, well, Christ died for our sins before the scripture was buried and rose again the third day, eight years old. Don't tell me you can't teach an eight-year-old and then later on it might soak in. You preach to him, which I did to him one day, might hit him and keep him away from that filthy religion that's going to try to get him to work for his salvation, to keep his salvation, to not, not and always be given to him and doing their dedicated work or whatever. Stay away from it. Well, in this scripture here, uh, all things are possible to him that believeth. The man believes, but what he believes is he's heard about this man, Jesus, and he questions him on his ability, but if you can, okay? The day you trust God, and the gospel of Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's no longer a matter if you can. You're trusting him that he did. He did it. My salvage, based on, my salvage is based on the fact that it's already done. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to accomplish something to make it work. I don't have to do something to keep it. It's established. All right, let's go on. Verse 26. And the spirit cried and rent him and sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead. I mean, it's near kill this boy to have that spirit come out of him. That's how much control that evilness had over him. And he's laying there and they, they think he's dead. Now watch. And the spirit cried in so much that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lift him up and he arose and when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? I mean, they were given the power. That's a, I mean, that's a decent question. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Taught us a lesson there, didn't he? He taught us a lesson about prayer and fasting. Fasting, people say they don't understand what fasting is. Most people think fasting is losing weight. Fasting has nothing to do with losing weight. Fasting has to do with denying your physical body what it demands by the hunger pains and the groanings and the growlings. Denying it and basically the best thing you can do is read. Get in the Bible. And as you pray and fast, and they're together, you notice they're in, together in the scripture, you pray that the Lord would show you something while you dedicate yourself to denying the flesh. That's what fasting is. It's denying the flesh. And uh, I'm not saying you have to fast. I'm not saying that is. I realize this is teaching in, in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it is a good lesson. Sometimes you'd be better off denying your body and praying while you do, reading the scripture. And you know, by the way, denying your body could be denying your body of things it wants, not only in food, but in eyesight or activities. Uh, so many people put everything in place of Bible study. Uh, I hear people say all the time, they say, well, if my schedule allow, I'll come to Bible study. That, that's a horrible thing to say because your schedule, and I'm not talking about people who have to work for a living, don't get me wrong on this, but I'm talking about people that put their uh, leisurely things in the way of the Bible study or a fellowship with God in the word. Um, you know, by the way, teachers prepare if they're dedicated to the Lord, and when I say dedicated, they they want to teach somebody. I mean, I, I look in the Bible all the time to try to find things that would unlock a key in your mind, and I pray to God, help me. I don't know where it's at. Help me. Show me. I can't read their minds. I don't know what they want. Uh, they're putting out the time to listen, or they're putting out the time to come. I don't know what they need. Help me, Lord. Please help me. Help me to get something, a little tidbit in the scripture that will help them in their daily life. And you know, 
people put things in the way and deny what God shows me or allows me to preach to do something else. And it works two things. It hurts them and it hurts me. It don't hurt God. God isn't hurt by this. But if he allowed me to learn something, and I'm just, just excited about it, I want you to see this, and you don't come, then it hurt you. And the God's world loves that. The God of this world loves to hurt people. Any form or fashion. It doesn't have to be a physical thing. It can be a mental thing. It can be all kinds of things. But people put so many things in the way of the Bible study where they could go away into the world they live in that day, that week, and have something that God knew was coming at you, something that would protect you and help you to get through it. And don't take, I'm not bragging about myself, please. I have no idea what you're thinking. I have no idea what you need, except one thing. You need to be saved. You need to come to the knowledge of the truth. You need comfort. You're in a, a, a evil world right now, a wicked world, a vile body, and you need help. And this man has come. My son needs help. And that's not the word, but he said, if you can. Well, God can. Don't doubt him. He can. And so instead of, well, if I can work it out, why not Lord willing? And the Lord is willing. So if you turn that over to Lord willing, he's going to make the way. He'll make the way. Now, turn with me in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I, if I didn't get the things over to you, it's my fault. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because the Lord's willing, all right? Sometimes I'm just stupid. What do you mean sometimes? All the time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it just hits me worse at different times. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God's world hath blinded the minds of them, which believe not. Unbelief is what I want to talk about. That, uh, Amanda, if you need a title, unbelief. Unbelief. This man, yes, he believed, but he needed help with his unbelief. Like I said, people believe that Jesus came in the world virgin birth. They've been taught that all alive. So why would they argue? They wouldn't know what to argue about it anyway. They believe that he lived a life and then died on a cross and was buried, rose again. And they believe that he was a lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And they believe that his effort was for sins. And they'll even tell you all their sins, but then they turn around and confess their sins because they're still in unbelief. And memory, 1 Corinthians 15, if you keep in memory what I preach you, unless you believe in vain, vain belief, unbelief. Lost believers. Brother Moore used to use the word lost believers. They believe, but they don't believe to the point of trust. The godless world knows that the gospel will save you. The gospel of Christ will save you. I hear people say all the time, these ministers saying, we're here to preach the gospel, but they never preach the gospel. The gospel of them is the good news about Jesus Christ. Well, that's not the gospel of Christ. Number one, it's our gospel, Gentiles. Number two, it's the power of God. We'll look at that in a minute. Number three, it saves people because it shows them their salvation is done. Now watch. Uh, believe not or believed not there are two words there uh some people believe not some people believed not now you say wait what's the difference though? well some people have never really heard and then there are people that heard it and they believed it not they no that ain't the way it is and they're belligerent about it 
to get angry. Haven't you ever noticed when you witness some people, sometimes they get mad? Well, those are people that believed not. There are other people that believe not, that they don't know anything. And so you witness to them and they look at you and they say, well, explain some things to me. And they question it and whatever. And they don't really go away mad. They just don't know. And you're a help to get them to see and help their unbelief. If you could draw a line with belief, it could go to a point and then stop. And something would need to help it to go along again. Okay. Timothy is a prime example of this. Turn to second uh, to first Timothy chapter, no, second Timothy chapter three. His mother and grandmother helped him to believe. He believed the scriptures. I hear people say, I believe the scriptures. Well, what's in them? Well, I'm not sure, but I believe the scriptures. So they took the word holy, the holy scriptures on the back of the Bible, and they believe that's a holy book. They believed in preachers being holy because they looked like they had a, a definite calling of God. And you know that the Catholics believe that that priest is holy or they wouldn't go and talk to him and confess their sin. Why would you tell him what you've done if he ain't something in your mind? But he's not. Okay. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, uh, 14, but continue thou in the things which thou have learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast heard, learned them, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Okay. So Timothy, it's not a problem with Timothy with Paul talking to him that he don't know the Holy Scriptures, but there are things in the Scriptures, so let's list that line, here you go, believe, so here, boom, there's Timothy right there, he believes the Holy Scriptures, but what's in those Scriptures is hid, that he really needs to believe on, to extend that belief, and what does God do? He sends Paul to him, he sent to Timothy, and those scriptures that Paul reveal the meaning are able to make thee wise unto salvation. You could have the scriptures in you. You could have went to church all your life. But you still do not believe all of it. I, I feel like I'm failing. I, I'm trying, folks. I'm really trying. You, you believe, but you need something to help you to believe to the point of trust. Because those two words are in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Turn with me to Ephesians 1, 13. Yeah, it's one thing to say, oh, I believe that. Well, it's another thing, trust. I told you the story about the man who was going to cross the Grand Canyon on a on a cable, walking across a cable. And so he stretches that thing out. Well, let's make it real, a canyon, a long canyon that's deep and wide. And he stretched that thing out. And it's almost like a guitar string. And he's got his big, long pole. But he's not going to use a pole. He's not even going to go difficult. He's going to ride a bicycle across there. And so the guy walks up and he looks at him and he says, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to ride this bicycle across the canyon. I say, what? Yeah, I'm going to ride this bicycle across there. He said, yeah, right. And he said, all right, let me show you. And he got on the bicycle and he rode out there a little ways. He's, you know, bouncing and everything. He backs up. He gets on the, where he was at. And he said, now, do you see, do you think I can, do you, do you believe I can do this? And he said, well, man, you have proved something to me. You didn't even hardly falter. Yeah, you can go right on across there. I believe you. He said, how much you believe? Well, you know, I believe you can. He said, well, do you trust I can? He said, well, what do you mean? I, he said, well, if you believe I can, get in the bicycle with me. Now, that's a whole new ball game. Man. It's one thing to believe something. It's another thing to trust it. Now watch Ephesians 1.13. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believe, 
you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. The only time the seal of the Holy Spirit promise comes is when you believe. Believe what? You believe to a point that you trust it. Well, how do you do that? How do you go from a point of that point of belief right on through to trust? Well, you need help. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Well, how do you do that? Galatians chapter one. Galatians chapter one, verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I uh, conferred not with flesh and blood. There was a man chose by God. Look in Romans 11. And not only is he chosen, it's by commandment of God. Paul, in his salutations in each one of his books, tells you by the commandment of God, by the will of God, each time about himself. And Paul did not take this upon himself. He's on the road to Damascus, and he's in a persecuting mode, trying to kill those people that believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Then all of a sudden, Jesus appeared to him, rose, risen from the dead. And not only does he believe it, he's going to be used later and shown what he's going to do later. And he's going to be the persuasion. Now, you understand something. If I get on Zoom with you, or if I'm in a Bible study with you or a conference with you, you don't want me to be a doubter. I have to be persuaded to let you see the persuasion. I'm called a help. I'm called a gift. And I can't go into a class doubting God. If I doubt God, what good is it to you? If I doubt his ability to answer your prayers, if I doubt his ability to show you salvation and it be a power that can work for you, if I'm ashamed of the gospel of Christ and don't preach it, or if I don't preach it because of other means, woe unto me, but I'm not helping you. But if I'm persuaded, it's because I was persuaded and I have a man that did it. Now watch. Oh yes, I had Brother Moore as a teacher and I've had other friends that are teachers, but the first man that did it is Paul. Now watch. In Romans chapter 11, that's why he's so avoided by the devil. He does not want that persuasion that Paul has. He is persuading people with another persuasion. We'll look at this in just a second. Romans eleven thirteen. 13. For I speak to you, Gentile, inasmuch as I'm the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my office. Turn to 1 Timothy and Galatians again. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and Galatians chapter uh, Uh, one in Galatians chapter one, verse 12, no, 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. You with me? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Turn to First Timothy chapter one. Verse 11, according to the glorious gospel, the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I don't think preachers today understand that, but whatever is committed to you of God, you hold it dear. You hold it dear. I hold dear, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. I hold dear that Christ died for our sins according to scripture and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. I believe that's the power of God unto salvation. Why? Because it saved me. And if it saved me, it'll save anybody. And Paul's quick to tell you that. Chief of sinners. But now let's read. 
verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, put him in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and persecuted injuries, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundantly, uh, exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. There's a pattern. But now look what he says here in uh, second, I believe it's second Timothy. I want to look first here. Uh, there's a couple of verses I want to get here. Uh, I apologize, Romans 8, that's what I want, and then I'll go to Timothy in a minute, in Romans 8, now if I come into Bible study and I'm doubting God, or I doubt what the word says, or I've said, you know, God meant to say, and see, it's very subtle in the way some preachers do it, God meant to say, that's a doubt right there, I wouldn't listen to that guy ever again, when God, God meant to say, now there are there are things we say sometimes like, uh, in other words, but God meant to say, no, no, no. God said what he means. Can he spell? Yes, he can. Can he interpret? Yes, he can. Can he give you the right words? Yes, he can. Can he inspire? Yes, he can. And if he can't, I will teach no more. I have the inspired word of God to teach from. I'm thoroughly furnished. And I want you, if you have a belief, but you can't go any farther to help you with your unbelief through the word of God itself. I mean, the man that had his son, I believe, and he called the Lord, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. The idea is that you can believe, and the Lord will help you with your unbelief by gifts that are given, and those gifts are men. I would do you no good at all if I didn't believe the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. I would do you no good if I didn't believe in the inspiration of the scripture and that the King James, which protects the faith of Christ, was what you are to be reading. I would be doing you no good at all. Okay? Now watch Romans 8 verse and I, and I also want um uh, galatians i apologize i had it and i uh, had a loss there uh look in galatians chapter five and romans eight now remember the persuasion that paul had is truth okay you can believe paul's persuasion can help you with your unbelief okay in Romans 8, verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? Now, the one thing I, I do need to see to, I want Galatians chapter 5, and I want Philippians chapter, I believe this is where I want, Philippians 3, okay? All right, Galatians chapter 5. Now, the persuasion that Paul has is to help you. It's to secure you. It's to uh, establish you. But there's another persuasion. Now, you got to think about this persuasion with the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, the persuasion, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. All right? Now, you, you come out of the flesh, Galatians. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's Paul's persuasion to the Galatians. And he's telling them, I'm not alive anymore like I am. 
Christ liveth in me. I've already been crucified. Then, then death has been abolished. I'm dead to sin. And the life I live, I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave me so for me. He declares what the faith of Christ has done. This persuasion shows up in Galatians chapter 5. Paul is not about to step back into the flesh and think that something else needs to be done to overcome and make it more better that he's already crucified. I mean, what do you need? more than being crucified already. You're dead to sin, Romans 6. If you're dead to sin, then whatever you inherited from Adam is gone. The way you sin is death. That's Adam. Wherefore, it's by one man. Sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all of sin. You're dead to that. You're a new creature in Christ. That's what we should walk in. That's Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And it's ordained that we should walk in them. Those good works. That's not an exact quote. You go over and read Ephesians 2.10. We should walk in what Jesus did, which is the faith of God, and not walk in the flesh. Okay. Now we're in the flesh but it's called the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20, go and meditate on that verse a lot. Meditate on it. Look at it and let it be as it is. And then say yourself in it. Put it in your mental mind. This is me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The next verse says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Ooh. You see how people are in unbelief by telling them that Christ died for their sins. He was buried, rose again, and then tell them that they need to keep the commandments. That's frustration. There is no doubt that's frustration. And so, you look in Galatians chapter 5, the persuasion that Paul is presenting is, there's nothing can separate you. You can't backslide. You can't, uh, in the sense of, have to rededicate. You can... Recover yourself from a snare of the devil if he's trying to get you to do something. That's not that's what Paul writes. But as far as falling away and never being able to renew it or anything like that, it has nothing to do with you as in Hebrews 6. We are sealed. When are we sealed? When we trust what we believe. What do I believe? I believe that Jesus died for my sins, according to Scripture and was buried and rose again the third day. I trust that to be the power of God unto salvation unto me. I believe it's in the scripture because the Holy Scripture is able to make thee wise unto salvation. The gospel itself says according to the scripture. It's not according to Paul. It's not according to Timothy. It's according to the scripture. I believe that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles because the scripture contains that understanding. Now watch, in Galatians chapter 5, so I want Paul's persuasion. I want to take Paul's persuasion into the Bible class. I want to take that persuasion in there so that when you get done with a Zoom or the Bible class, you're persuaded too. I want you to be able to walk, how do they say it, with guts. I want your intestinal fortitude to be on the word of God and not a hope so, maybe so, or Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. I want you to have belief and not unbelief. Now what? Galatians chapter 5, verse um, uh, 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of the righteousness by faith. 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Why did I want my grandchild to go into that church? I don't trust churches. I trust God and his word. And if they're telling things that are not his word, I want nothing to do with them. And it's not because I'm cruel. It's because I believe. And they will not present to me the truth. Then I don't want my children to not have the truth or my grandchildren, or my children in faith, in Christ, to not have the truth. Now watch Philippians chapter 3. I believe that's where I want. Maybe I'm, there was a verse I had in mind. Um, no, Philippians 1, I apologize. Does belief cause conflict? Yes, it does. I had a man one time left the church here. He started coming back and uh, he was getting along real good. And he said, well, we're going to leave. And I said, why, why are you leaving? He said, well, I'm just, I'm getting a point in my life where I don't want any conflict. I looked at him. I said, good luck. You don't want any conflict. What conflict? You're the one that was causing the conflict. It wasn't the scripture, it was him. And of course, he hadn't been back. Well, in Philippians 1.29, for unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, believe on him, okay, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Uh, turn to Acts 13. Uh, that'll be a good verse when I think about it. In Acts 13, one of the things that aggravated people about Paul is this. It aggravates people about Brother Moore. They used to. They were scared of him because they were afraid that he would give them scripture or say something that would make them look bad or feel bad or whatever else. Uh, a lot of people don't want to talk to me. And I know that because they've left the church and won't talk to me. They won't discuss why they're leaving. And there's a good possibility of, you know, why because they're leaving on their own feelings and they're not looking at what the word of God says. Because what if I was to take some scripture and show it to them and it was contrary to them leaving? And this is what Paul said in verse Acts 13, verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And Paul and Barnabas wax bold. Instead of whimpering down, say, oh, it'll be all right. Uh, how can we solve this problem with you? You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you, you, you got to be kind in some things and help people. Sometimes you do. But when it comes to contradicting and blaspheming what Paul says, you don't have to be a, a little weak mouse. And he said, Paul and Barnabas wax bold. And said, it is necessary that the word of God, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentile. Oh, infuriated them. Infuriated them. Um, I never deal with people. I, I don't brag about being preacher. Number one, why would I brag about something that I'm not a uh, I didn't get called to be a preacher. I mean, I didn't choose to be a preacher. I got called to be a preacher from a, from a source likened to, it's hard to explain to people, but the Lord dealt with me through men and the men like the men of Ephesians. So, well, as a matter of fact, turn to Ephesians. Um, Paul chose Timothy, not God, yet God was moving through Paul. And he circumcised him. He wanted him to go with him. And then he committed unto him the things that I heard of me uh, teach faithful men. They may be able to teach others also. He, he's commissioning Timothy to teach. And that's why you have First and Second Timothy, great pastoral letters for preachers to read and to 
to grasp a hold of and give them persuasion and give them that boldness. Um, I don't have to be bold because I want to be mean about women teaching. I got what Paul says. I don't have to be bold and mean about uh, uh, the fact that uh, there are men out there that are working for their flesh and not for the spiritual side of it. Timothy's got a lot of response on that. There's a lot of responses in Timothy, first and second Timothy, that I don't have to say, well, I, I don't know what God wants to be done. I know what God wants to be done. I can read it. And I'm not saying that I'm a great uh, scholar. I can read it and see it. I, I don't have to make it say something. Just, okay, that's what it says. It tells me how what a deacon's supposed to know. What's a, what's a deacon supposed to know? He's supposed to have the mystery of the faith in pure conscience. If you don't know what the mystery of faith is, it's in 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6. Very simple. The mystery of the faith. A deacon's supposed to know that. Uh, look in, um, in Ephesians chapter... Uh, one verse three blessed be the god father of our lord jesus christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in christ do i need to doubt that we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places no it's there do i need to doubt that we're holy and without blame before him in love no it's in verse four do i need to doubt the completeness of colossians 2 10 through 12 no it's there it's written down and our our apostle who is persuaded <clears throat> wrote it i mean he wrote it so uh do i need to doubt it no should i come into bible study and doubt it no can i come into bible study this is what god says this is what god told me to do well god told me to study to show thyself to prove unto god a workman and needed not to be ashamed rightly dividing the order of truth he told me to do that so i'm supposed to do it for you i'm not necessarily have to give you the verse i'm supposed to show you rightly dividing the word of truth i have to show you how the the truth that paul wrote is divided between those who first trusted and us we're in the out there in the future uh, nobody even knew that it could go 19 centuries without the lord returning nobody knew that uh, Paul had no idea that God would extend out there 19 centuries or more to get people, me, you, if you're saved, to get 19 centuries out there to get us a time that nobody even knows about, and it's called the dispensation of grace. He can reach out there in time, and there I am being born. I'm being separated from my mother's womb, and one day, by another man preaching, he calls me. And he saw that I'd listen and that I would need him. And then he sealed me when I trusted him of what I believed. I believed that Jesus died, was buried and rose again the third day all my life. <clears throat> the day that I trusted that to be my salvation, he sealed me. You see, the Lord helped me with my unbelief. That's a tremendous thing when you think about it, uh, to help you with your unbelief. And, and uh, you know, there's a couple other things I want to say before I close. Uh, hmm. If I can... It's time's sake, Jimmy, and I know Jimmy Jan got to leave. Uh, look at Romans 3. This, uh, this might be a good verse. Romans 3, uh, verse 21. Well, let, let's start in uh, uh, 19. Now, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, and those are famous words of Paul that should be considered. 
but now in Christ, no, I apologize, but now the righteous God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Most preachers are living in time past by what they're teaching. They're not living according to the but now doctrine. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all. It went to all people. In other words, the opportunity for people to be saved is unto all. That's why God could state in 1 Timothy to Timothy, who will have all men to be saved. God's not looking at men's sins. He's looking at whether they'll believe. How do I know? Let's see the verse. 322. Even the righteous God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all, and here's the catch, and upon all them that believe. Well, there's no difference. So a man be judged whether he believe or believe not. If he believed, he has life. Look in Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Who's the all men? All that believe. Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. And if you believe and then you're shown the truth, and you receive it, then you get justification of eternal life. But if you receive it not, as in 2 Thessalonians, then you're condemned and damned, not because of your sins, but because of your unbelief. This is in the dispensation of grace. Don't worry about the other times in the Bible. This is in the dispensation of grace. And people in the dispensation of grace are going to have to answer for not receiving the love of the truth that they might be saved. Oh, yes, and a lot of them will be believers that didn't trust what they heard. They rejected it. They received it not. Uh, I didn't get done with what I'm going to do, but that unto and upon is very a very good subject uh to study and we may get into that next week lord willing i hope it's helped you out though